I've just spent a week using and at times struggling with the Creality CR30 3D print mill. So with that in mind, here's seven things you need to know before you consider buying one. By now, you've no doubt seen other videos on this. The Creality CR30, also known as the 3D Print Mill, made possible by Naomi Wu. In case you haven't, it's a belt printer. Instead of the Z axis printing up, the print head is tilted over 45 degrees and Z is on a belt. And that allows really long objects, infinite in fact. So what's different about this video? Well, firstly, this model is a step later than other ones you might have seen, and therefore closer to the production units that you might get if you buy one yourself. Secondly, in this video, I plan to show a deep dive of what it takes to actually print these really long parts. It's one thing to visualize the finished product, it's another thing to know exactly what work needs to go into achieving that. I've had some frustration, but also some great success, so I feel I'm ready to give you the insights you need before you consider buying one of these. This is not a new idea, but it is attributed properly. Naomi Wu, in conjunction with engineers from Creality, are responsible for bringing you this printer, and she's done it the right way, as this technology has been around for a bit longer than you might expect. The earliest version of a conveyor belt 3D printer came from MakerBot, way back in 2010. Things were pretty static, however, until 2017. That's when Bill Steele of Polar 3D brought this printer to MRF 2017. It had a conveyor belt mechanism shoehorned inside a MakerBot replicator. This was a personal project and not for sale. A few months later, Black Belt 3D launched on Kickstarter, with this printer still being available to purchase today. By all accounts, it's a quality machine, but comes with a price tag upwards of 11,500 US dollars. Also in 2017, Bill Steele teamed up with PrinterBot to create the printer belt. Priced at around 1300 bucks, but unfortunately no longer available. The next major advancement came from Carl Brown of Knack 3D Designs. As seen here, being interviewed by Joel from 3D Printing Nerd, he produced an absolutely enormous belt 3D printer, and best of all, he released his design open source, so if you want a white knight, there's nothing to stop you building one. So here we are in 2020 with Naomi Wu's 3D print mill, also known as the Creality CR30. It's currently on Kickstarter with an early bird price of US $700, but eventually it will retail for US $1000. And not only does it have the support of lead Marlin developer Scott Latin, but it's been produced with respect to the lineage of this design, with input from Bill Steele as well as Carl Brown. So Naomi not only has their blessing, but has also received their input in order to make this product better. She has a nice video that summarizes the development and bringing this product to market. In short, this is an affordable version of a 3D printing innovation that has been done as a collaboration with attribution where required. Naomi is even pushing for this thing to become open source. This 3D printer is much the same, but completely different. The reason Creality is able to make this printer so much cheaper than previous models is that they can build on their existing products. The LCD display is exactly the same as an Ender 3. The dual drive Bontech extruder is just like from a CR10S Pro or CR10 Max. The filament runout sensor, the same as on other Creality printers. The hot end is identical to an Ender 3, but with twin 4010 blower fans for improved part cooling and the frame and motion system, like other Creality models, is based on V-slot extrusion and V-rollers. From the moment you unbox the printer, your experience will be familiar. The usual items come with the printer, including tools, a range of spare parts, and a high quality instruction manual. Despite the change in geometry from the printer, assembly is really straightforward, just bolting together pre-made sub-assemblies, plugging in some wires and the Bowden tube. You even get the same satisfying removal of the protective film. But then we do have some significant differences. The motion system for X and Y uses Core XY kinematics previously seen on the Ender 4. And clearly the biggest change is for the Z axis we have a continuous belt. And with that comes changes to familiar procedures. When the printer homes it only homes X and then Y 
and Y is responsible for the gap between the nozzle and the belt. To set this distance and therefore our first layer squish, we have an optical sensor on the lower left of the frame and by turning the bolt, we can move it up or down to change the point at which it triggers. The heated bed is underneath the belt and only takes up a relatively small section of the belt's length. It's mounted together with a flat metal plate, the whole thing suspended on springs and adjustable like your regular bed on a 3D printer. In each corner is a pretty nice knurled thumb wheel and when adjustments are finished, there's a locking knob underneath that tightens down and prevents that corner from moving. Some things however never change and that's it if you have the nozzle too far from the belt the print won't attach properly and it will fail soon after. Have it too close and you'll get elephant's foot along the edge. This printer is capable of amazing things but it's not really a replacement for your existing 3D printer. What I mean by that is that the 3D print mill should add to your existing 3D printer collection rather than be the only printer that you own. As far as I'm concerned, it has two main advantages. The first is printing really long objects, prints too long to fit on a normal machine. I think it's perfect for cosplay, like this sword scaled up to 700 millimeters long. Normally large items like this come in pieces, need to be printed separately and then reattached to make the final object. In fact, it was hard to find a sword on Thingiverse that had the entire thing in one piece. But fortunately, this version did. For this one, I was able to import the full model into Tinkercad and simply cut it in half to print two halves and put the two together. Print time, thanks to a large nozzle, was around 7 hours per sword half. And gluing together the two flat halves was really straightforward. The other thing it's really great at is pumping out parts repeatedly without any user input. Normally for multiple parts, we would fit as many as we could on the build plate and then print them all at the same time. If one fails however, it's likely to knock over the others and in a domino effect, destroy the whole process. This printer however, can print the next object without even removing the previous one from the belt. And in the event that some of the objects fail, it doesn't actually affect any print started afterwards. As you can see, the fox closest to the camera has failed, but the next one has started up no problem. This makes multi prints more reliable and we also have the bonus that there's no stringing between our objects. But it's not all sunshine and lollipops, as that 45 degree angle introduces some curious side effects. Take this Zelda sword for instance. Some parts it looks beautiful with really lovely even extrusion, and the printer has done a good job showing the details. Other parts however are more difficult for it. There's even some gaps in between shapes where the slicer hasn't even tried to extrude and other areas aren't stacked consistently. For a cosplay item that's likely going to be filled, sanded and painted, this doesn't really matter, and this is a useful print. But you simply wouldn't use this over a traditional 3D printer for your average printer job. If you want more detail on this, Angus from Maker's Muse covered this very well in his video on the 3D print mill. Everything you know about slicing is turned on its head, or 45 degrees to be exact. To explain what I mean, let's import G-code intended for a belt printer into a standard slicer. Here's the sample G-code from the SD card, in this case a 3D Benchy on a 45 degree block. As you can see, it's crazily distorted. The same goes for this simple test piece, which you'll note is not actually touching the bed besides the front edge. And then we have this epic crocodile, which is also distorted and slanted and facing up into the sky instead of flat on the bed. So we need a special slicer and fortunately we have two to choose from. Option 1 is found on the SD card that comes with the printer and it's called Creality Belt. It's basically a skinned version of Cura set up for a belt printer and as you can see, Z goes for a very long way. If we import that same G-code from the SD card, the crocodile all of a sudden looks like it should and we're able to drag the slider to get an accurate preview of how this object will be printed. Item 2 we download from the Black Belt 3D Printer website. It's another modified version of Cura, this time called Black Belt Cura. As far as I can tell, it's very similar to Creality Belt, obviously both are based on Cura, and each of them have a custom section that deals with parameters specific to these type of machines. For instance, the belt wall speed will be slowed down, so any extrusions made at the base of each layer 
have a better chance to adhere to the belt material. Go too fast and parts will curl up on the edges and eventually fall off. At this point, I have to thank Carl for all of his guidance and for sharing his Cura slicing profile with me. The failures with the Fox model that I showed earlier were the result of blobs being left on the model that would later catch on the nozzle, knocking it clear off the belt. At one stage, I went deep down the rabbit hole doing retraction tests, trying setting after setting to try and eliminate these blobs on layer changes. I managed to fix this and minimize stringing in the end, but ultimately I got way better results when starting with Carl's slicing profiles rather than going it alone. Slicing profiles aside, we still do need a different mentality when planning print orientation. Typically, when placing an object, we need to ensure it has a flat base to adhere correctly to the build platform. Apart from that, we're trying to minimize overhangs and this boat with this orientation isn't really going to present any problems. When we print on the belt printer, however, we still have a flat base that we need to stick to the belt, but instead of going down all at once, it's built up throughout the print. Therefore, the starting edge of our base is just as important as its overall shape. The way I have the boat oriented here has a very small contact patch and it's gonna make it more likely to fail. If I rotate it around 180 degrees and preview the G-code again, I now have a much bigger surface area to base the rest of my print on. Our overhangs also become trickier to visualize because we're building on a 45 degree angle. Once we get to the right hand half of this cutout, it essentially becomes a very steep overhang. And if we look on the finished model, we can see that in this area, we did in fact have some drooping. To effectively plan how an object is printed, at this stage, it's best to import the model and preview the print, especially with complex features like overhangs that may need support material. This printer is improved with specific mods, in my humble opinion, of course. Now much of this printer is already moddable because it shares so many parts with other Creality machines. Almost immediately, I fitted my first mod with a large 0.8 millimeter nozzle, and I did this to speed up print times. My first test print was the crocodile off the SD card. And honestly, I started this one by accident because I was looking for a faster print. I think it's fair to describe early progress as very, very slow. Day turned to night and eventually it got late enough that I had to go to bed. And the next morning I was greeted with this. A dislodged and failed print is annoying, but that's only telling half the story. After 15 hours, only around 15% was completed. Furthermore, the stacking of the very small layers was inconsistent, exacerbated by the 45 degree angle. So I swapped the standard 0.4 millimeter nozzle for a larger 0.8 millimeter version. Printing at 0.2 millimeter layer heights was agonizingly slow. Printing at 0.4 millimeter layer height was still slow, but exactly twice as fast as before. And as a bonus, the print on the right that should be coarser from the larger layer height seemed to have its layers stacked more consistently than before. Obviously, you don't have to do this, but in my opinion, if you're printing large objects, it makes sense to use a large nozzle to speed up print times. Next up, Octoprint. There's plenty of spare frame where you can mount a printed case holding a Raspberry Pi, and it was easy to mount a webcam with a quick 90 degree adapter that attaches a webcam to the upper frame. After flipping the image, this gives a really clear view of the print surface and allows you to monitor long prints from afar. And that includes from the other end of the house in bed, where I used a mobile phone Octoprint app to access the live camera feed and ensure that everything was well. Furthermore, you can record really great videos of your print using the inbuilt Octoprint time-lapse feature. If you are going to be producing long prints, to me, it makes a lot of sense to be able to monitor them easily. Another advantage is that since you don't need to pull the old model off before you start the new one, Octoprint can do that remotely as well. And it gets even better with plugins. An obvious match for this printer is the Continuous Print plugin by Louis Sarwal and Paul Goddard. Installed easily from the plugin repo, it requires very little setup. All we need to do is enter some G-code that we want to run in between prints. In my case, I put the printer into relative movement mode, advance the belt 50 millimeters, and then put it back in absolute mode. Now in the continuous print queue tab, all of your slice G code will be listed below, and we can build up a print queue 
by clicking the tick to add print jobs to the list. We can easily rearrange them and we can have multiples of the same print too. When we're ready, we press the start queue button and our items will print in order. If we wanted to print something indefinitely, we can press the loop button. I successfully used this plugin to print multiple objects overnight without having to intervene for each one. Creality Belt does have a setting where we can input the amount of copies, but I think doing it through Octoprint is a more flexible and easy method. The belt is its greatest strength, but also its weakness. Now the belt is what makes those really long prints, as well as continuous printing possible, but it does introduce implications. Now this machine is a little bit more updated compared to other ones you've seen by other YouTubers, and it should be closer to the final production model. So how did it go? It's made from nylon, and like the other belts you've seen, the finished part leaves a ghosted effect on the surface. This is only visual, however. The belt leaves a fine texture on the underside of the model, and I really don't mind this. Unlike previous belts, there's no zigzag join. Instead, there's a seam that is slightly raised to the touch, and this does leave very subtle marks in the underside of the print in that location. My main issue, it's just not as sticky as a traditional bed. Early on, I decided I wanted to print an enormous folding propeller assembly. I imported the blade into Tinkercad, cut the base off to make it flat, and added a little brim. On a regular printer, you'd think that this would print okay. On the belt printer, everything started well, but adhesion was lost partway along the blade, the part wobbled around, looked terrible, and eventually fell off. So I came back and added a brim the whole way down the narrow section. But even that one fell off as well, and I had to abandon the project. I was getting really frustrated, so I employed one of my old favourites, a liberal dose of hairspray. And I'm pleased to report that things improved. Adhesion was strong enough to support this sword merely by the end of the handle, the rest hanging in mid-air. Rotate the belt to run the object off the edge, however, and it still comes loose without any issues. Another problem I had was the belt not being correctly tensioned and tramming to one side, which seemed to have a devastating effect on print quality. All of these boats were printed back to back with the exact same G-code, and on one side of them they are identical. But if we flip them over and inspect the side where the belt wasn't quite right, you can see the print quality was highly variable, looking like layer skips. Fortunately, there are tensioners at the front of the machine to get the belt aligned correctly. Using Octoprint to get the belt spinning continuously, I checked the tension across the belt and made adjustments until it pulled itself to the middle and remained consistent. And after this adjustment, I finally got prints that were consistent from left to right, in fact the best ones I had had since starting with the printer. While I was able to get on top of these issues, I guess the point I'm making is that the belt introduces areas that require specific calibration and knowledge. And as we know, 3D printing is already quite finicky. Finally, this 3D printer is not for beginners. I've been 3D printing at home since 2013 and I've used dozens of machines now, but at times using this, I was deeply frustrated. When things were bad, they were really bad. Consider this my worst print with incorrect slicer settings, a misaligned belt, and general inexperience. Based on this, there would be no way I could recommend this 3D printer. But contrast that to this sword, which by comparison, looks absolutely beautiful. It's not perfect, but it shows how far I came once I had some experience and knowledge, and I expect that I will further improve my results from this point onward. When starting out with a belt printer, I think it's reasonable to expect some challenges. So now is a good time to thank Carl for his patient support. If you're willing to persevere, I believe you can get some amazing prints from this machine, and I hope to be showing some in the future. I just want to make it clear that you will be in for a learning curve at the start. I'd like to thank Naomi for supplying this unit free of charge so I could try it out, and for her continued efforts in pushing Creality towards innovation and being open source. It's also worth reminding you that backing a product on Kickstarter has inherent risk, even if this machine here seems to be of the same standard as off-the-shelf Creality printers. I'm dying to know what you think about this printer and if you're considering backing it. Please let me know down below in the comment section. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, happy infinite 3D printing.
G'day, it's Michael again. If you liked the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.